Hello. So hopefully you can all hear me correctly. I hope so, at least. Um, yeah, I think I think you do. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for coming to this uh, webinar. This is my third webinar for BenQ. I'm so happy to have you all here. Uh, you, if you already been on this webinar before, you know really how it works. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, some kind of webinar slash workshop in the beginning, and and then we're gonna have some Q and A at the end. So anyway, let me just introduce myself real quick. My name is Hugo Gerre, and I am the founder of Hugo's Desk. And I would just like, before even, I even start, I would like to thank so much to BenQ Europe for the invitation. And uh, thank you so much also for BenQ for all the support they have given me, for all the support they gave to Hugo's Desk, for all the support that they gave me over these last three years. You guys are amazing, so thank you so much. Um, and also I would like to thank all my Patreons and all my students that I can see that they're online. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces on the list of people that are present today. So thank you so much for joining me once again. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, gonna, um, I'm going to kind of basically start off by presenting myself for those of you that don't know me. I'll be quick, I know, because a lot of you already know me. Um, and we'll start by a small introduction of myself, of my pipeline. Then right after that introduction is finished, we're going to jump into Nuke and do the workshop. The workshop should take about 45 minutes. And once we finish the workshop, I'm going to go through all the questions. Now, before I present my presentation, I'm just going to warn you that because of bandwidth issues, I'm not going to keep my webcam. I'm basically just going to present my keynote in full screen and I won't be present on the webcam. So I'll be back on the Q&A. When I'm back on the Q&A, I'll turn on my webcam again. So let me just uh, start by uh, switching off my webcam. Like I said, a lot of you already know me, so I'm not going to take too long on this presentation. But um, let me basically start off by saying that, you know, I'm a director and a visual effects supervisor. Um, I'm called, my name is Zugo Guerre. I know it's a bit sound, a bit weird to pronounce it like the way, but that's how I, my, my voice is, because I'm Portuguese. So that's my name in Portuguese is Zugo Guerre. Um, so it's a, I'm a director and visual effects supervisor. I also lo love to do very strange poses and stupid photos when I go to E3. <laughs> Most of these photos are from there. Um, I'm from Portugal. Uh, if you don't know, don't know, Portugal is not part of Spain, no, as any as a lot of people think it is. It's actually a, se a separate country in Europe. Um, I was actually born in Porto, which is a lovely city. I would always advise you to visit this lovely city, especially because of its Porto wine and because um, of the historical landmarks as well. Um, I do visual effects. Visual effects is this, like basically uh, <laughs> we put glows on things, we put sparks on things, we put explosions on things, which is very relevant for today because we are going to basically work on an explosion rendered on Udini. So this is the kind of thing we do every day. Of course, this is a, obviously a joke. I would recommend you highly not to do it. <laughs> not to do this. <laughs> um, anyway, I have a very long experience. I've been working for 20 years in the visual effects industry, both in film, television, and commercials, and game cinematics. The biggest places I've worked so far has been the BBC, Nexus, Jellyfish, The Mill, uh, Fire.Smoke, and Yugo's Desk, which is my own company. There is one company missing on this slideshow because I haven't updated it yet, which is Sony. I'm currently working as a, as a visual effects supervisor for Sony PlayStation. That's my latest job, really. Um, for a long time, I was the head of the Nuke Composting Department at the mill. For those of you that don't know me, I just want to make sure you understand that um, I do know what I'm talking about. I, I was the head of the Nuke Department, and I've been using Nuke for 12 years. So I just want to make sure that, um, that you know, so that you know that I have the credentials to, <laughs> to back up. I've worked with a lot of game studios as well. Um, I've worked with all these game studios on multiple, multi... Uh, that's kind of my work these days. I mostly work on the games industry. Um, my last projects were with Games Workshop and it was with Sony as well. Uh, these are some of the games that I worked uh, as either a director or a cinematic director or a visual effects supervisor. Obviously, the game missing in this list is the game that I'm working on currently. That's the game that I'm supervising for Sony PlayStation. I cannot tell you what game that is. Of course, obviously, you will find out in the upcoming months once the game gets revealed and then once the game gets launched as well. Um, I also am a teacher, that's like my second life. <laughs> I'm not a secret agent, but a teacher. I teach on all these different places. 
so if you ever are a student of these places, you can just kind of hook, hook up with me and then we can have a chat as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. And currently I work from home. Um, you can watch some of my other videos on YouTube. And I work from home because I work remotely. Um, I kind of found that working in the office was very stressful for me, especially because uh, I live in London, you know, and living in London means that you have to commute quite a lot. But you can watch some of my videos about that. I have a lot of uh, things about to say about that. Uh, this is my desk. That's the desk where I am currently right now. Um, this is my desk, which is um, um, basically, yeah, it is very uh, tough to commute, uh, Barak. <laughs> You're saying that on the chat here. It is definitely very hard to commute. And that's why I work from home. So basically, I work remotely. I have a, a, a network of artists that work with me. And this is my controls, uh, control center. Um, you basically have... Um, you know, everything I need here. And of course, obviously, all the monitors are from BenQ, uh, since that's the, the brand that I've been using for years and years. Um, also, working from home gives me the advantage of having things like this. I can have this awesome Doom um, uh, mat for my mouse. Just look at it. It's just, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> I really love this mat. So it's pretty cool to actually be able to have exactly the equipment that you need. So my equipment kind of uh, ventures between color correction. I do a lot of grading. I do, I do a lot of editorial. I do a lot of visual effects. Um, so, um, oh, okay. You're saying that you can. There's someone here saying that there's no sound. Um, is it true that you can't hear me? See, let me know, guy. Uh, let me. Uh, someone else, let me know if you can still hear me, because uh, obviously someone here is complaining on the questions that there's no sound. Okay. Okay, so then maybe it's just a, a localized thing uh, for for him. Okay, cool. So as I was saying, I jump, I have many hats. So I jump from visual effects to editorial to grading. And that's why I have a rate system. I have uh, calibrated monitors from BenQ. And um, I have, um, of course, a, a color surface. Um, and um, the, the core of my, uh, of my workstation is the Mac Pro 6.1 which has 128 gigs of RAM, 12 cores. You can watch this later. You can just check the specs later. I don't want to waste any time of the workshop on this. Backed up, um, backing up that Mac Pro 6.1, I have three Mac Pros 5.1s. All of them completely uh, kit maxim. They have 12 cores, 128 gigs of RAM, Quadro 5000s, you know, everything is maxed out. There's no, there's no extra performance I can take out of these bad boys. So I'm really expect, I'm really looking forward to having the, the, the Mac Pro 6, uh, 7.1 so that I can continue my thing. I mostly use Linux and Mac OS. Um, sorry, I mostly use Mac OS and Linux. I don't, I do not use Windows for work. Um, but so on the other side of my, of my, uh, Yugo's desk, uh, that's the other side. It's mostly my huge collection of references. So this is an advice for everyone here. If you ever uh, want to have a lot of references for your work, or if you need to have a quick reference for something specific that you're trying to comp or you're trying to color correct, it's very useful to have books like this. Like these are books of art of. So if you go to Amazon, you can have the art of Battlefield. You can have the art of Uncharted or the art of God of War, the art of Aliens or the art of Mafia. All these books are incredibly instrumental for my work as a visual effects provisor, director, and art director in general, because I can just scroll through these books and kind of find references for my clients, and I can find things that I need. Um, I also have my little three Tele Awards. Very proud of them. Uh, I actually just won three more this year, so now I have six of these, but the other three are on the mail. I don't have them yet, but now I've won, I've won three more gold uh, statues like this, which was great with my latest trailers. Uh, obviously that you saw a very lit version. When I work, I don't have any lights on uh, because I'm doing color correction. I have very subtle lighting uh, when I'm doing color correction, as you can see here. Uh, the bulk of my pipeline uh, revolves around the PD, the PV, and the SW series of BenQ. And I use them mostly to have, I mostly use the SW as my main monitor because it's a photography monitor for my desktop. I then use the PV, which is the video series for my previewing in 10 bits. So that means I can do color correction with them and I can kind of uh, use them as my reference monitors. And of course, I have some scopes as well. As you saw there, the scopes on the uh, right side from Blackmagic. It's very useful to have scopes when you're doing color correction. All of this is outputted with SDI out, not with uh, just desktop. This is actually a video card using Blackmagic. Like I said, I have many videos on my YouTube channel. You can go and check that thing. 
Um, so that's, um, of course, obviously, I would highly recommend you for you to have a look at BenQ's monitors, not just because this is, of course, a BenQ um, uh, sponsored stream, but I do use them uh, in every my, all my productions. And the ones that I would really highly recommend would be the PV series for post-production video, you know, DaVinci, Premiere, After Effects, Nuke. And then, of course, the SW series for photography, which are very handy because they have HDR and they have uh, Adobe RGB and they have sRGB and they have a lot of the necessary tools you need for advanced photography. So um, keep an eye on these monitors and check them out. Um, so that's it for the introduction. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, like I said, um, this is um, kind of um, what we're going to go through today. So basically, we're going to go through the intro, which we just did. Then I'm going to just really briefly talk about what deep, what is deep composting. When should we use deep composting? We can also talk about the nodes, uh, the pipeline. Uh, when do we use them to to, together with some regular nodes as well? And how to actually use the information for color correction, how to use it for point clouds. And we're going to do a wrap up in the Q&A at the end. And let's just jump into Nuke uh, directly. So. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try my best not to move the mouse too fast because I know it's very choppy at the moment. But I brought a shot here. Uh, this is a shot I did for Vermintide 2. Um, this was a game cinematic that I directed and supervised last year. And this is a 4K cinematic. You can watch the cinematic on my website. Just um, And I can, or doing the q and I can send you a clip. But this is the shot we're going to go through today. This, this is basically a live, ac a live action shot, so I can just break up it a little bit from you. We have a live action plate, which was shot on a motion control rig. So this is basically green screen uh, with an actual model. And we've um, put a lamp in the scene so that we could use it as light interaction. We, of course, obviously did keying and rotoscoping. That's what this is. We have the rotoscoped version and with keying as well. Um, we also have the same thing, but from different lighting sources. The reason for that is because at some point on the trailer, you have light sources from different parts because uh, it's a stormy night. So you see the flashes of lightning uh, showing up. And that's why you see lightning from the right side, lightning from the left side, and lightning from the front side. It's very important for us to, because we have motion control, we can just repeat the camera move. Um, and that's what we did. Because also we also had motion control, it allowed us to actually do fog passes as well. So we had a fog machine on set and then we could fill up the room with quite a lot of fog so that we can kind of like, um, you know, add this on top. We basically use the screen operation to add this fog uh, so we could, we could add in certain locations more fog. But I have a YouTube video about this. You can kind of check it out. We also have like a matte painting set up. This is a pre-rendered matte painting. The matte painting, of course, was used in 3D system in Nuke. It has motion blur baked in from the 3D system. This is the original matte painting. This matte painting was done by David Gibbons, uh, one of the matte painters that I use uh, for a, lo a long time. He was one of the matte painters at the mill as well. Um, and this is the final matte painting. Obviously, this has all the different uh, channels from Photoshop. This is a Photoshop file that you can see here directly. Um, and then, of course, we've placed it inside the 3D system, and then we basically used the, the 3D system to do some projections and for us to do some camera movement and also to do some depth of field and to do some motion blur as well. Now, uh, going forward, we also had rendering. So as you saw on this, there is an explosion here that we've merged. So basically, we had that was the plate that we shot. And then, of course, we added a CG explosion uh, to that plate and the CG explosion. Of course, there's other things as well here. There's some rats and some flares, some heavy grading as well. Um, damn, you guys already you guys already have 37 questions. Damn, that is um, yeah, we're gonna be here for a while for the Q and A. <laughs> anyway, uh, we also have some renders. So these are renders from uh, Udini. Udini is of course the best application for you to kind of develop some really nice uh, explosions and effects and particles. Um, it's the industry standard for that. So we have multiple renders for that. We have the main explosion. We also have the particles and debris that blow up. Like when the explosion happened, there was, a, of course, a cloud of debris as well. We also have like the, uh, basically, um, the, um, 
a photo photogrammetry model that we shot on set because I used a lot of photos to do photogrammetry. Not very detailed, but it doesn't really need to be very detailed. Photogrammetry models are just for you for references. In this case, we use them for references for the explosion. And then, of course, we have a cloud of smoke, which is um, kind of merged. And the reason I brought this project today, because this is the perfect situation where you should use deep compositing. Because we have like a cloud of smoke that should be merged on top of that one, and then a particle that should be merged as well. Now, normally, uh, and this is already going in through the... Um, oh, we also have something else here. We have some photogrammetry rats. So these are rats that we're using, we used photogrammetry, and they are loaded into Nuke directly um, with the UVs and textures. And we use them uh, in multiple locations in the project for us to have them. And they were, they were lid inside of Nuke using the ray tracing. Um, we didn't really model them anymore because they were so much used for background and foreground stuff that we didn't felt that we needed to really have them on very high detail. These are highly detailed enough for what we're trying to do. And then you can shade them and put some lights on them. And as you can see, they are really poor quality. But when you are really far away, it doesn't really matter because you can kind of get away with it. And that's what we kind of did. Um, so the reason why I'm talking about deep compositing is because deep compositing is perfect for these kind of situations when you have uh, particles that need to kind of, especially when there's a camera move, you know, when the camera move is like going rotating or if the camera move is rotating around, you kind of have a problem here because then the particles, how do you comp this? You know, how do you put the particles on top, but then also they need to be behind? How do you have the smoke that is in front, but also behind? So this becomes a huge big conundrum when you start comping it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just share with you like how this would be comped normally. Obviously, keep in mind that this has no holdout mats. Holdout mats usually are the one, the way that you use uh, to actually comp these kind of things. So the CG department would put a holdout mat, and then you can kind of like, you know, mat the thing so you can merge it. But in this situation, let's assume that the I'm going to do a really quick comp here. So let's assume that the background is this, right? So that's um, just double check. Yeah, that's this resolution. Yeah. So let's say that this is the background because this adds the explosion. Then, of course, obviously, if you want to comp this, you would comp probably the, the the debris in top. So I would use a merge node input on. Remember, uh, in Nuke, it's always background first. I'm going to actually do this because, you know, we're not savages. We need to be um, uh, we need to comp things properly. <laughs> so this is the 2D version of the comp. So basically, um, I would have my background, my foreground, and I would use merge nodes, right? So I would have background as my explosion. I would then put the foreground, which would be my debris, which I would merge like that. And then I would put another merge node and I would put my clouds on top like this. So obviously this works and then it doesn't work as well because you have the explosion here, which has no holdouts. And then this thing here is every single particle, the ones on the back and the ones on the front and the ones in the middle, right? So you have like a, a depth between these particles. Now. When you merge them on top, obviously this doesn't work because you see these, for example, these hot spots, the, the big, big lumps of orange that you see inside the explosion, they should be behind the explosion. And so the way that traditionally we do compositing is that we would get the CG department to, to make a holdout mat so that effectively these objects would not be visible on this render. That means the CG artist would have to do holdout mats. It would take him forever to do that on all of them. And then uh, even more complicated is on SME transparency. Like this is a SME transparent volume from Unreal, from, from Houdini. How do you even do a holdout on a SME transparent model? It's not even possible. So when you merge it, how do you fix that? Like you can kind of, okay, maybe I can do a, a screen, but then it's too SME transparent. But then if I do a plus, that's even worse. Uh, I mean, I would have to most likely, you know, kind of do a lot of holdout mats or maybe render this in different parts. And, um, you know, so I would have the foreground part, the background part, all those kind of things. So essentially, this would never work. This would be a problem for these three renders. Would have to go back to CG and, and kind of render this out um, again with holdout mats. Now, in this situation, when you don't have, when you, when you have, uh, when you have access to deep compositing, you have something very different. So in here, you can kind of see that deep uh, nodes are different from uh, read nodes. You see, a read node tends to be a square and it has all the channels and it's an EXR and, you know, as it usually is. 
But then a deep node is actually not a square. It's like this kind of rounded slashed node just represent that that's a deep node. Now, when I look at the explosion rather than Houdini in normal rendering, that's how it looks. And if I look at the same exact explosion in deep, you can kind of see that they look exactly the same. So if I compare one and the other, they look the same. If I zoom in, they look exactly the same. There's no difference between them. The biggest difference, though, is in this. So this EXR is a flat 2D EXR. This means that if I go here, I can clearly see that um, this, you see here the difference between them. This is a 4K render, by the way, so it, it's very heavy, of course. When you go at the bottom one, you can kind of see that it's 2 gigs, right? So that's a 2 gig EXR. If you look at the top one, that's an 11 gig EXR. The reason why it's 11 gigs is because it has deep information. So not only it has the RGB values of the image that you see here, but if I open up this, you have a channel called deep. If I open up the deep channel, which obviously doesn't look much, it just looks yellow. And when you look at this, you can kind of see that if I over the mouse, just look at this area here, the area on the bottom there. And um, you'll see that I can kind of see that I have ranges. I have like 11, 12, 13, 15. I have like these really monstrous uh, high dynamic range values. And that's what the deep information is. Now, to show you what the deep information is, um, the best way to visualize it is to actually use a deep to points node. Um, and I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. Um, but I think that's the best way for you to kind of, for you to kind of understand. So, um, let's say that then we have the deep render, which is that explosion that we just saw. Let's go back to the RGB here. And I'm going to put the deep into this node. So this node is a node very similar to the node in 3D. Like if you look at, at my list here, most deep nodes have their counterparts in 2D. So the deep color correction has the 2D. The color correction. The deep to points has the 2D position to points. The D transformation has the 2D transform. The deep crop has the 2D crop. The holdout doesn't exist in 2D. Uh, of course, you can do it with the merge, of course. Um, and then you have the deep merge, which exists as a merge. The reformat as a reformat. The sampler doesn't really exist as a node itself. Well, it exists, but it's not really the same. Deep to image, of course, is specific to convert deep to images to 2D. And then deep recaller is something a bit different, which we will talk in a minute. Now, I need to get, get going with this because we are, we are running out of time. We're always, always rushing. <laughs> so keep going with the questions, though. We're going to try to bake a record here or something. We have 43 questions so far. Just keep going. And we have 106 people uh, on our show. We have 24 people that left. Good rivens. <laughs> I'm joking with you guys. Um, I am definitely joking. Um, uh, so... The way that this works is you put the deep into the deep input and you have to have the camera. So this is the camera that came from Maya or Houdini or whatever 3D application you used. In this case, this camera came directly from Houdini. And what happens once I look at this is that I get something like this. I basically get a camera and I get a point cloud representation in 3D of the explosion. So of course, obviously, this has a lot of advantages. Uh, first of all, um, if you look at uh, this through the camera's perspective, it looks exactly the same as the explosion we had before, which is great. But the reason I'm showing you this is because this is the great way for you to see what deep is. Like 2D is, of course, a 2D image, but you see we have deep information. That means we know what's in front, what's in the middle, and what's behind. Obviously, it has limitations because it can't know what's behind everything because it can only do a projection setup from the camera angle Obviously, we can't render everything, otherwise it wouldn't know what's behind. But that's really, in essence, what deep is. Every single slice in every single point here, it's almost like, think of it almost like a, the image has been sliced by multiple depth um, um, uh, blades. And so that is why the file is 11 gigs. You know, the original file, which is, uh, sorry, it's here. The original file was 2 gigs, and if I play it back, it plays back quite fast. Of course, this is not cached yet. It's playing back at around 7 frames per second. And once it's cached, of course, it plays back in real time. Um, but if I try to play back the deep file, 
you can see that if I try to play it, it's incredibly slow. It's only doing two frames per second. And this is the major problem with Deep. Deep is incredibly heavy and, uh, to play back. So that means uh, temper your expectations when you render Deep and when you play back Deep. Uh, the other thing also that you have to keep in mind is that Deep always should be rendered in 32-bit float. This means because it's 32-bit float and not 16 or 8-bit, the image is even bigger. That means you have more color, you have more dynamic range, but the dynamic range is necessary because without 32-bit float, the deep information will be gone. It will not be there, okay? So don't forget, the file is huge. It's hard to play back. And this is why normally these days, because computers have not even catched up with having this kind of speeds, you know, because this this is, you know, for you to play back this in real time, you would have to have multiple raids of M2 blades to do that, you know. It would not be easy because it's too heavy and the decompression of the XR would take too long. So normally in, in visual effects, the pipeline uh, tends to be that you render always a 2D version in 2D and then you render a deep version. In fact, inside Houdini, you have that option. You can just render both of them at the same time in one go. Um, and the reason why it's so heavy is really because in deep you have those extra values which you can visualize really well when you look at the point cloud like this. Obviously, the other reason why this is cool is because um, you can now place other 3D objects inside of Nuke. So you can use the 3D system of Nuke to put other particles or to put those rats that I said, you know. Uh, you can place them inside the image, inside of outside the image in 2D. That means if there's a rotation going on, the deep will take care of it. So let's let's get back to this thing again, um, talking about how it gets merged. So I'm gonna now merge the deep uh, renders instead of merging the 2D renders that we had before. So first of all, I'm gonna get all these particles and I'm gonna put them on the side here. So remember, this was how I merged them in 2D and I'm now gonna merge them in 3D. Now, keep in mind that there's one thing I need to let you know, which I had to make a little change. You see there is a deep transform here uh, the reason, sorry, not the transform, I need a, a deep, uh, deep reformat. Uh, the reason I need to put a deep, deep, a deep reformat here is because back then when we rendered this, um, all the renders were done at 3K. The smoke was at 3K. The debris was at 3K. Remember, these, these are um, production assets. So because they are production assets, they're not perfect. They have some problems. And so we have the debris in 3K, the smoke in 3K, but then the explosion is only in 2.5K. Reason for that was because we ran out of time back then. We were really rushing out <laughs> this project and we had to kind of reduce the resolution. And so you can use a deep reformat to just reformat it back into the resolution you need. Obviously, this is not ideal because I am scaling my render but there is really no other way for me to do this. I have to scale it if I want to merge it. Now, the other thing I'm going to use now here is I'm going to use a deep merge. So if I, um, well, I have it already. Well, I just typed it wrong, sorry. Uh, you know, I have fat fingers, so that's why it doesn't work sometimes. So what I'm going to do here is the same exact thing. I'm going to put the background on my deep with my debris. I'm not going to do it like that because otherwise you can't see it. And I'm going to use another one and I'm going to use the background like this like this. Now, effectively what happens now is that the result of this merge is like that, you see? And the result of the deep merge is like that. So you can clearly see, for example, here, just by looking at the 2D mode, mode merge, I'm going to look at just the debris. Remember all these pieces of debris, these pieces of debris should be inside the explosion. When I use deep, I now have them inside the explosion as they should. So you see, if you look at this, all the 2D images are on top, but then if I look at the deep version, the particles are correctly inside the explosion. And the same goes for the smoke. The smoke, which was just on top, like this, now on the deep, you can clearly see a perfect deep render and actually a complete merge of the smoke with the volume. Because like you saw in the 3D, you have the volumes there, they are there, and the information is there, so that means Nuke knows exactly which pixel should go where. That means a pixel can go behind, it can go in front, and it can go in the middle. I hope this is all clear so far. We, we do have 50 questions, <laughs> which is insane. Um, but let me just try to get a bit faster because we have a lot to go through. So other things we have here as well that could be very useful. 
We've talked about the deep to points, which was the way for you to actually have the points in the 3D system. I'm going to delete that. We've talked about the, the deep reformat is not really necessary because you've just checked. Deep merge is just like any other merge. Uh, I am going to use the deep sample just to show you something. So this is, of course, obviously very good when you want to try to do some color correction in deep. So normally, if you want to do some color correction, you just put a color corrector and you just, you know, go, go ahead here and you want to do a color correction, you do it, you can do some gamma, you can do some highlights, you know, and if obviously it involves affecting the entire image. The maximum thing you can do is you can go to the ranges, you can kind of select what is a highlight, what is a shadow, what is a midtone. You can kind of get away with trying to merge it, but you never really can do a, a complete deep color correction. Now, on the other hand, the deep explosion that I have here can do that. So if I, for that to happen, of course, I can put a, I can put a deep color corrector here. And there is no deep grade, by the way. There's only, the only nodes that you have on deep, they are, they can be found on this D here. And these are the nodes we have. There is no other nodes at the moment uh, besides the nodes you can see here. So, um, as you can see, the deep, the deep color corrector looks exactly like the deep, uh, the color corrector. And it also has the ranges, but it has something new here. It has a masking. And then you have these A, B, C, D points. Now, how do you know what this is? This is effectively the way you can kind of pinpoint in deep, in Z axis, what you want to actually call the correct. And for that, you need to use something called the deep sampler. I'm going to put a deep sampler here. And obviously nothing happens when you just put a deep sampler because you see there's like a little dot on the corner there. So I'm going to now go into my position and move this dot around. And you can kind of see as soon as I start moving it around my surface, it gives you all these values. There's two things to think about this here. You have six samples, means that the samples relates to how many blades of information you can find behind a pixel. That means, for example, on the corner here, if I go really close here to the side here, you see I kind of have, because this area here is very SME transparent, I only, like these pixels here, only have three samples because it's a very thin, thin image. So if I go, for example, to my, I'm going to just show you what I mean. I think it's easier to visualize the deep, the, the sampler here. So you see, if you look at this and you look through the top view, you know, I'm just now looking at through, sorry, looking through the top perspective, you see some objects have more deep than others. Like, for example, the middle of the explosion is very deep. You have one slice, two slice, three slice, four, five, six, seven. You have a bunch of slides. And in fact, if I sample the front of the explosion, I would get uh, maybe seven or eight samples all the way to the back. But if I sample just the corner of the explosion or just the back of the explosion, then I would have less slide slices because there's not enough information behind it. Hope you guys are all uh, getting me. So that's why when I sample the corner, I only get like three samples and three values. And when I sample the front, like if I sample on the center here, you see I get much more. So you see, I can actually, I think it goes all the way to 10. Let's see if I can find the highest value. And it's just like, um, uh, it's a bit picky, um, a bit fiddly. I'm going to use the mouse <laughs> because the Wacom tablet is not going to work here. Uh, can I find one with 10, please? Oh my God, this is so, well, I'll, just, I'll keep with an eight. So what does this mean? This means that this pixel in space exists very much with eight samples behind it. So that means you have eight things behind it if you want to sample it. And you see here we have the deep front and deep back. Now, in here, you have the corresponding RGB value that you found here, and that relates to the values you find on the viewer. And then this, 12 and 13, that is the actual depth information. So that means that this is, the 12 and 13 is the distance to the camera. So if you, for example, look at the grid here, you see that 10 is this entire distance here. So you see that camera is around 13 uh, values from the camera. And on the back there, it's much more further away. So these values actually relate to real world coordinates in 3D, okay? That means that you can relate them in the 3D image, both in Houdini and Nuke. It's all one to one. So when you're scaling things, you know exactly where they are. So now that I know this, that means let's say that I want to make sure I only call the correct this area. 
I know that, for example, this area is going between 12.5, 14, 12.5, 14. But if I go to the back here, it goes to 14 and 15 and 16. So I know, for example, if I want to color correct the front, I know it's between 12 and 13. So I'm going to open up my color corrector, uh, thinking into account those values. And I'm going to go in here and say, okay, B is the front, C is the back. Let's talk about A and D later. So I'm going to put here 12, you know, maybe 12.3. And in here, I'm going to put 13.1. So those are the values you see here, front and back. And so now, um, I also have, by the way, I have to limit the Z. Otherwise, it's going to have a much bigger range. So now that I've done this, I'm basically telling him that I only want to correct between these ranges. I'm going to go back to my color corrector here. And if you see, I hope my viewer is on. No, it's not on it. So you see, now if I gamma down, you see I'm only gamming down just that area. So that means now I'm only color correcting just the corresponding area. Now remember, when you look at it from the top perspective that I was showing you, like this, remember I said 13, uh, 13, 12 to 13. That means it's between from here to there. You see, this is what I mean. That That's the top. I'm, of course, looking at from a top perspective. If I look through the top perspective, imagine that's 13, that's 12, and that's 13. So I'm, I'm basically isolating this area here to call the correct. I hope you're all going with me. Um, we still have 100 people watching, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and um, thank you again. Thank you so much for being here. Also, thank, I'm going to just shout out to the BenQ. Thank you so much, BenQ, for inviting me as well. We do have 57 questions, which is fantastic. So I hope that was that was clear. So now that we have that all sorted out, that means I can now call the correct just that area. Now, remember that I told you that never mind A and D. So A and D is the extra range for feathering, because as you can see here, this is really harsh. It's kind of cut point on the sample. So that means that you what you can do is you can do this. You can basically put the same values here. And then what you can do is you can kind of like start moving them down. So, for example, well, let's say that we do zero, like to start on zero on that one. But in here, we can kind of feather the back. So let's say we do it in decimals here. So you see, if you look closely here, we used to have a very hard cut on the color correction. As I start doing other ranges here, the color correction kind of fades in in deep. That's because I'm now using a much more thin um, uh, range for this. Now, once I do that as well, uh, you see, I can still move this entire thing. So let's say that we go all the way to the back here. And let's say that we keep going forward with this. And I keep going, well, let's let's sample it, sorry. We should probably sample it. So let's say I want to color correct the back of the explosion. So I'm going to see, okay, this is 18.8 to 19. So that mean is 18.8 to 19.1. And obviously, now that I'm doing that, I need to kind of be careful because now if I go to my color correction, you see now, sorry, I'm not viewing it. Now I'm basically color correcting, you see, the whole thing. The reason I'm doing color correction on the whole thing is because I have not set a front mask. So I'm going to basically cut my mask in the front there. And now I should only color correct the front. I'm going to just try this out. So I'm going to gamma down. I think I went a bit too far on my masking. I need to go, let's see here. Let me just gonna open up the masking a bit more because I think I went a bit too far with it. Definitely went too far. Oh, that's why, sorry. Because it needs to be 15 here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My mistake, I didn't notice that A was there. So you see here, now I'm basically color correcting just the back of the explosion. So that means I'm just like now tweaking this area here instead of the front. So, and I could continue doing that by sampling, for example, just the middle. And so this means I'm kind of color correcting in, in, in Z space. So now let's imagine that we go for 14, 15, and 16. And in here, maybe I have 13. So if I do that now, I see, you see, I'm basically color correcting the middle area here. Obviously, it goes a bit berserk because you need to, of course, give it enough space for the feathering. Otherwise, this is not going to work. But as you can see here, now I'm color correcting just this area here in the middle. I'm not color correcting the back and I'm not color correcting the, the front. So that's incredibly useful for you to do color correction in Z space instead. Now, keep in mind, this is distance to camera. So if the, if the object moves, you will not have the same color correction. 
because you see this is distance to camera so that of course if the object is moving to the camera's perspective then you will lose that frame where you were okay now we are of course um time does fly when you're having fun <laughs> that's for sure uh, we don't have a lot of time left but i really want to show you still another thing as well so here's another thing we can also do with this wonderful world of deep compositing deep compositing of course means that you can also um, effectively transform things. So I'm going to just disable this color corrector and I'm going to transform things from here. So you see, um, I could, if I want to, put a deep transform here. And what happens here is the deep transform allows me to move this object in Z. Because obviously you can't really move it to the normal transform because uh, you can't really put, like if you try to put a transform node here, it doesn't plug in, you know. It's a bit like the 3D system. When you when you try to plug things to the 3D system, it doesn't work either. So the deep doesn't really go well with 2D nodes. So you can't use that one. You have, you have to use the deep, deep transform. Now, the deep transform, you can do things like that. So, for example, if I want to move an X space, I can just do, okay, 10X. And now I'm moving the explosion in X space. You see, as I move it, it actually effectively gets merged with the object as it should. The same goes for the Y space. If I do 100 in Y space, I can go up and down. And as you can see, it correctly covers the objects. So I'm now, you see, I'm moving it. And this, for example, this piece of wood is getting revealed in Z space. So that means that when I'm moving objects um, in the deep transform, I'm moving them in space. The same goes for Z. If I move them in Z, you see, I can actually put the explosion in the front of everything if I want to. Now the explosion is in front. Look, look at the stick of wood here. Um, but if I go, sorry, that's maybe not the best one to show. Just, um, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, what, have, what have I done here? Why can't I see it? Uh, sorry, just a second. Zero. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, I think I, I, t I know what I did. Uh, sorry, I, I, by mistake, I did, I did too much negative. So you see, as you go in Z, I can actually go into so far that now I'm actually moving this object in Z space. Now, the best way to, for me to, for you to visualize this, because you see it, it's hard to visualize here, but you can kind of see that it's actually merging in Z, is if I pipe this into my 3D system. Remember that we had a bunch of things here on my deep, so I'm going to basically uh, pipe uh, into the deep here not just this but i'm going to pipe the the entire thing we just did and so that means that on the 3d system where's the 3d system so now i have the smoke and the fire and the debris you see it's all here and uh, not just and i can even have everything including it takes a while to load up of course remember deep is very heavy so this is now with the smoke. Of course, obviously turning on the smoke, it's not gonna really help me, is it? <laughs> Since I can't see, I can't see anything. <laughs> so it's not gonna be, easy, gonna be very easy for me. Anyway, like I said, the, this is a great way for you to visualize what I'm doing. So if I look at it from the top perspective here, so see in the top perspective here, what I'm effectively doing with this deep transform is I'm moving my debris, like I'm moving, sorry, my explosion, you see, if I move it in Z space, I move it to the front. So I'm basically moving it to the front, which means it's covering other objects. The cool thing about this is that now this means that I don't have to go back to CG to move these things around. There's, of course, obviously a lot of limitations. Here's the limitations. I can move sideways, you know, like I can, I can move in X. I can move in Y. That means if I go in the top here, I can also move on Y position. So that means the explosion is now on the top there. Obviously, the limitations are that you can never do point, like you can't do 5.5. You have to do round numbers. The reason you have to do round numbers is because antialization will become a problem. The only place you can do not round numbers is in Z. Z space allows you to do enter it. So that's the only place you, you, where you can actually put a something point something. So that's actually the deep transformation for you. Now, Obviously, there's a lot more than this. This is just a one-hour workshop, right? I mean, you guys have to kind of like really experiment with this. There's another node that I really want to show you when in deep, which is the deep crop. And of course, the crop is, as the name says, you can crop things, right? And so 
what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna just like put the deep drop, drop crop here, and I'm gonna show you two different things. So, uh, well, by the way, if you wanna pick up the correct resolution, you wanna make sure you have the stream selected, and then you put the deep crop, so that the deep crop gets picked up with the correct uh, resolution here. So, obviously, um, let's look at this deep crop. We have a Z near, a Z far, and a bounding box. I'm gonna switch off the bounding box for the moment, and the Z near as well, so we can see everything. So first of all, uh, why do we have both? Like the first one is the actual Z space. So remember, we've established that the explosion goes from like, re remember we established the explosion goes from like 12 to 18 or something in terms of Z space distance from camera. So if I put Z space of let's say 14 and Z far for 16, this means now that I am actually cropping everything around that area. Obviously, this has a huge problem, as you can see. It has an initialization problem. So it's very hard for you to do something that would be cropped on the front. You're much more better suited to crop something in the back. So you see, now I am basically cropping just the back explosion. So this obviously has a lot of uh, advantages. You can crop it for color correction. You can even crop it for masking. Imagine you want to mask uh, to do to do the. You can kind of do that. Um, now, why do we have a bounding box as well? Now, the bounding box is for you to limit when you want to kill and clip. So imagine here. Imagine I want to kind of only have this part. And if I try to do that, you see what happens here. I can kind of pinpoint it that I know that it's around here to just have that part. But now, unfortunately, I can't really get rid of... Because I've lost the front. You see, I've lost the front. Because, of course, deep compositing is a, a, a using deep information to know where things are. So um, that's why we have a bounding box. So if I use a bounding box, I can now, in terms of 2D, tell them, okay, I just want to look at this part. Okay? Don't want to look at anything else. I only want to look at this part. And so now I can pinpoint my crop a lot better. So I can now say, okay, I only wanted that part there. And now I have access to cropping just this section. Obviously on a volume of smoke like this, it's a bit hard to use this like this. This would be much more perfect for the debris. So let me show you what would happen if I can use the debris like this. So if I look at the debris, and if I put like, you know, a deep uh, crop here, the debris would be much more useful. So let, let's see here, we do, let's say we do 14 to 16. So that means we can pinpoint a piece of debris and crop it. Um, so let's say that we open up the Z near. So if we open it up all, it shows all the sticks. Let's say that we want to isolate this stick, right? So of course, obviously, if I start isolating this stick, I lose it right away because I lose the front one as well. I want to isolate that stick. And I can kind of start cutting stuff from the from behind. Now, for me to be able to pinpoint, like, for example, imagine this these pieces of stick, the best way would be for me to use a bounding box. And I can use a bounding box to just tell them, okay, I'm interested on that part, right? That's the only part I'm interested on. And now I can just basically start cutting everything off except that part. And now I can turn on the, the, the bounding box and now I have access to just these things, nothing else. And this is, of course, I'm cutting in Z space. I'm not cutting in just 2D space. Now, we don't have a lot of time left, unfortunately, because this was supposed to be 60 minutes. We already are pretty much at 60 minutes. We are pretty much on 50 minutes so far. And I still want to answer the 75 questions you guys have. But last but not least, I need to show you one important thing. So I would really highly recommend you to, to kind of research this more. There's two more nodes that I really need to show you uh, for you to kind of understand. Well, actually three nodes. I need to show you these three nodes really quickly before we wrap up. So this is all very beautiful and everything. But of course, obviously, when I comp, I'm going to just disable these crops, uh, disable these things. So obviously this is all really pretty and everything, but if I comp this, I can now play it back and I can still watch it in 2D and it's not very heavy. Obviously if I try to play back a 2D, a 3D deep composite, it's super slow. Just look at how slow it is. It's running at one frame per second. So it, it becomes incredibly slow for you to actually comp this way interactively. 
So here's the three nodes that I want to talk about. So one of the nodes is the Deep2 image. So this node is specifically built to convert whatever you've done in Deep into 2D. That means that imagine that this is now done. You've merged everything as you want exactly in space of 3D. You've color corrected everything you wanted. You know, let's imagine we have this color correction on here. Uh, we have like the crops as well. You know, like we had everything we wanted to do. Uh, and then you can put the deep to image. And now this image is a 2D image. It's not a 3D image anymore. So there's no deep information anymore. So that deep information is kind of gone. And now I can actually put regular 2D nodes. That means I can now put transforms, I can put color correctors, I can put grade nodes, I can put whatever I want in terms of 2D, because from this moment on, after this deep to image in node, everything was converted from the deep 3D into 2D, as you usually use inside of Nuke. So that's one of the most important nodes that I want to make sure you guys know. Um, just double checking if everything is good. Yeah. Uh, the other node I want to show you is actually uh, the deep holdout. So the deep holdout is also similar to a node that converts to 2D. So imagine that for some reason your CG artist wants an alpha channel for you to comp that requires you to mat these, these boxes by the explosion. So what I can do here is I can basically go in here and say, okay, I want to pick up the debris. So I'm going to pick up the debris and I'm going to use the holdout from the explosion. Okay. So what happens now is you can see now, as soon as I activate this, the debris gets cut by the explosion in terms of alpha channel and RGB. So now this is a 2D image. It's not a 3D deep image anymore. And now I can put color correctors and I can put transforms. So the deep holdout allows you to export holdouts that you might do. And of course, these holdouts could also have deep crops. So imagine if you had a deep crop, you can crop something, you know, like, like we did here. Like, actually, I can just activate this thing here. You see, we only had that object. And let's just open it up a little bit more. I'm going to just not have the bounding box. Um, and, so, and so you see, my crop cropped all these pieces of wood. And then my holdout cropped the smoke and the debris as well. And now I can use this as a new render, a new alpha channel. Obviously, I would recommend after you use a deep to image to render it to an EXR because it's super heavy. Now, last but not least, before we go, and I know we didn't went into everything, you know, this is a huge topic, right? There's a huge, huge amount of things to go through. And I don't want to really, well, in fact, I'm not even going to go into this node. This node is basically built for you to bring in deep information into 2D images. So, um, imagine, for example, this image here does not have any deep information. You can basically pick up the color of that and put the deep from the explosion, and now you've merged them both. So that means that you are merging deep information into non-deep information. This is very useful for you to actually comp everything. Imagine you had a lot of AOVs. You see you have a lot of AOVs here. So that means that I could have comped because AOVs are, you don't have a shuffle node inside of Nuke, right? So that means you could have shuffled and basically comped all the AOVs that you wanted. And basically you see, I have just the light. I have just the, the, the smoke. I have just the spotlight. I have all these different AOVs. And because there's no shuffle node in, in deep, you can't shuffle out just that pass. So what you can do is you can shuffle it out and then you can add deep information into it if you want to by using the deep recaller. But this is a conversation for another time. Uh, we are really running out of time and I don't want to like really, uh, we should really jump into the Q&A. We have 79 uh, questions. I hope this was a great introduction for deep. Uh, obviously, um, I will try to do more videos like this on, um, on my YouTube channel as well. Um, I'm going to just basically um, finish off before we go to the Q&A with um, a little bit of a shameless promotion. I do apologize for that. Uh, but just so that you can continue to uh, check how I work. So here's my shameless promotion just before we wrap up to the Q&A. Um, if you want to know what I do, and as you can see, I was doing this webinar today, just follow me on Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, it would be Hugo C. Guerre. So if you go to Hugo Siguerra, or you can also go to Hugo's desk on Twitter, 
And then you know always when I do a webinar, you know, you can know when I do my Twitch streams. You can also go to my YouTube channel. On my YouTube channel, um, you can find all my videos and you could also help me to reach 20,000 subscribers. I am on 19,772 subscribers right now. So I wish I could get you some help to actually get, reach 20,000 subscribers. And you also should check out my Twitch streams. I do Twitch streams twice a week. Uh, currently, I'm doing them on Mondays and on Thursdays. So if you go to Hugo's desk on Twitch, you can see my streams. On Mondays, I stream some games. So I'm basically playing some games while I'll answer some Q&As about visual effects. So if your question wasn't answered today, you can jump into Twitch and I can try to answer it. I'm currently playing Silent Hill 1 while I answer visual effects questions. I know it's a peculiar combination. <laughs> if you want to vote to my videos, if you want to help my channel, if you want to vote for my videos, if you want to vote for the Twitch streams, and also including having access to the Nuke scripts of all the projects that I put on my YouTube channel and on the Twitch streams, you can uh, support my channel on Patreon and then you have access to the scripts as well. Um, and also, just to let you know, today I launched my complete Nuke composting course. So if you want to check it out, this is the second year in a row that I did it. Last year we did uh, 119 students and we had 60 hours of video tutorials. This is an actual uh, complete course in visual effects. Uh, I just launched it 10 hours ago. We already have eight students. So if you are interested on doing advanced composting with Nuke, just feel free to join this course in Kickstarter. So just go to Kickstarter. It's called Hugo's Desk Presents, the complete Nuke composting course. And that is pretty much for me today in terms of the presentation that I had. So let's just jump into the Q&A. Um, so there are 83 questions here, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, basically... Um, <laughs> uh, so first question here for Manish Sunar. How much did you spend on your workstation setup? So Manish, my workstation setup was expensive for sure, but it's already a few years old. When I buy equipment, Manish, I buy equipment from professional vendors. So I would advise you to do a workstation like from Dell or from HP or from Apple. These workstation level performance, like these computers are performance workstation level and they last a long time. Most of my computers, uh, you know, one of my computers is six years old. The other computer is 10 years old and I'm just now about to change computers. Usually a workstation lasts you for like about 10 years. So it's very expensive to buy it the first time but then you can really kind of last for a long time. Exact figures of my setup, I would say that probably goes into the ranges of 30,000 maybe, something like that. Um, so I have 12 cores on all my machines. All my four machines have 12 cores. That's a question that Barak asked. Another question, um, let's see here. Is there any chat to speak? Yes, there will be. I have a question here from uh, Dwayne. Do you ever look at random stuff like clouds, some rocks, for example, take a picture of it, potential future references? Absolutely, Dwayne. I do that all the time. Um, I do a lot of references and I also take photos. I, 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 I have a lot of cameras and I always take photos. I always take a camera with me, take photos of skies, I take photos of rocks. And, event, and, and actually, this is something that I really, really, really recommend to all artists on this, um, on this uh, that, that is here right now. You should always buy a camera and take as many photos as possible. So, um, uh, Barak is asking, the light bulb also adds to the explosion effect. Yes, it does. So the light bulb was there to create the light interaction on the tower so that the tower would have that kind of light. Otherwise, we would have to do it in CG and it was just easier to put a light bulb there. Uh, Dwayne again is asking, you said that Houdini is the best and also industry standard. How does Think Particles on Foam Effects stand up for Houdini? So Think Particles and Foam Effects are really good, that's for sure. But please keep in mind that Houdini is by far the industry standard. Like all the companies in visual effects, all the big companies only use Houdini. The reason for that is because Houdini is a, a node-based uh, 3D application and that's so much easier for you to customize it's so much easier for you to do a pipeline it's also very friendly for pipeline and Python so that's why Houdini is used uh, Juan Cevalios I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly says how difficult is a compositor to jump from VFX movies industry to the video game fields uh, as usually there is not no mat uh, sorry 
As usual, there's now so much job posting for video event companies searching for compositors. So, um, yes, that is true. There is no compositors on the video games industry, but you can use your, your skill set in the video game industry the same way. They do use After Effects, they do use Photoshop, they do use 2D applications, and you can always learn 3D. Once you are a visual effects artist, it's all about pixels, it's all about uh, polygons, it's all about color and images. You want to invest in skill sets. So obviously, I am not working only as a compositor on the video games industry. I'm working as a visual effects artist. I'm working as a VFX supervisor. I'm working as a 2D artist. I've worked on many capacities on the video games industry. Always keep in mind that it's not about the software that you know. It's about the skill set. So if you learn photography, if you learn color, if you learn composition, you can definitely move those skill sets into the video games industry. Gun, Gun Sekaran is asking, could you share some working footage? Uh, I could. I can share. So if you go to my Patreon and you support me on the uh, $20 level, you can have access to some of the footage of my uh, tutorials. So, uh, Noham Katan asks, what's the difference between Z-Depth and Deep? So, it's very different. So, Z-Depth is a mask. It's basically an image, black and white image, that only has black and white figures for where things are in, in the Z space. So, it, it's very limited. It doesn't have any information of the pixels behind it. Now, Deep has the information of pixels behind it, which means... We didn't have time to do it on this on this uh, workshop, but you can literally put an object inside the render using deep with complete perfect edges. And if you use just depth, if you just use Z-depth, you won't be able to do that. The same also goes for if you try to do depth of field with Z-depth, you'll get a lot of artifacts on the edges. But if you use deep, you don't get any artifacts as well. So Julian goes, thank you so much for being here, Julian. Uh, great to see you again. He asks, hi, Hugo, how do you do deep EXR? Is, Udini, is it on the Udini render parameters? Yeah, it is. So you can use Udini. Uh, you just need to switch on deep uh, in Udini. You can also use um, uh, Redshift for deep. You can also use uh, Arnold for deep. I'm not in completely certain V-Ray supports, but I'm sure it does. I know Redshift does, I know Mantra supports it, I know also Maya supports it, so you can definitely check that out. But it's there should be a parameter in the render engine that allows you to not only render a 2D image, but also to render a 3D image, okay? So then you can experiment a bit with this. Uh, so Nike, Nikel, uh, thank you so much for being here, Nikel, uh, once again. Uh, so you're asking, how is a sequence rendered in deep format? Is it only possible in Maya? No, just like I answered now, you can render it in pretty much any game, any render engine these days. Uh, Nohan Katan asks, for your regular renders, do you use 16 or 32? So for all my beauty renders, I use 16 because it's more than enough for what you're doing. Uh, you do not need 32-bit just for the, you know, for the specular pass and the GI pass and the reflection pass. You should just use 32-bit float for the utility passes and for the deep passes. Always for those two. And um, Stefan Ryan is asking, what are the bottom tool set for you to have? Uh, sorry, what are the bottom tool sets you have on your side menu bar? <laughs> well, I have a bunch of plugins that I bought. I have like a bunch of gizmos and scripts that I build. And also, of course, gizmos and scripts from Nukipedia. That's pretty much it. Okay, so I'm not really sure what you mean with this, Farhad. Farhad asks, with point pass into the XR, it shows a similar view like this. Yeah, it is white, Farhad. Farhad, thank you so much for being here, by the way, Farhad. So, uh, Point Cloud is the same using 2D XR, but the deep information allows you to merge in 2D in uh, three-dimensional objects. So, it's more than just the point pass. It has the information of the pixels behind those pixels, which is the Point Cloud does not have the information of what's behind. I think, uh, you know, I ran out of time on the workshop. Uh, obviously, I should have uh, went through it more deeply. <laughs> I'm sorry for the punt. I should go deeply into deep, but we didn't, we didn't really have a lot of time to go through everything. Uh, so let's see. So Barak just says, incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Barak. <laughs> so uh, Andrew uh, Shiriak says, can you feather the wood going into the explosion? It doesn't matter for this example, but for your future reference. 
Uh, if you're talking about color correction, you can. And if you're talking about cropping, you can't. So the only way really for you to do this would be for you to basically use the uh, hold out mat with some color correction and then you can kind of feather it a little bit and then you can use it as a mask. You can, of course, it's a bit of the uh, hoops to go through it, but you need to understand that Deep is something very new. So the Foundry, every time they launch a new version of Nuke, there's more new tools in Deep. So maybe keep, keep, keep checking it. So Damien Torn asks, what is the best way to deep depth of field in post using deep? So the most advanced depth of field node is uh, the PG Bokeh from Pellegrins. So, sorry, Pellegrins. So it's called PG Bokeh. That is by far the best depth of field node. It's a plugin you can buy for Nuke, and it's called PG Bokeh. Okay? Try to find it on the web. It's really powerful. Um, okay, so Nikhil is asking, can deep composting be done in Nuke or just NukeX? That's a great question. I actually don't know. I believe it can be done in both Nukes, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe someone else can answer that, but I, I really do not know if it's only... If you just go to the website on the Foundry, you'll find out probably. Um, let's see here. Jonathan, Jonathan uh, uh, Jaco Yank asks, or deep files just another pass on the XR or an entirely file different? Yeah, so a deep pass is a different EXR. So basically you have a 2D EXR and then you have a 3D EXR, which is the deep. They're both EXRs, but you have to render them separately. You can't currently merge them, unfortunately. Um, let's see here. Uh, Dan Proyer asks, is it possible to create a deep image starting with a 2D image plus a Z depth? It is possible, but it won't really give you a very accurate result. Okay? Just so you know. Uh, so... Shajels asks, Shajels asks, can we use position, uh, world position to create mats for CG? Yes, you can, but you can use a node in Nukipedia called PMAT. So just search for that. But remember, position passes are not deep information, so it's not the same thing, okay? Deep information is different from a position pass. But if you go to uh, Nukipedia, you can find a node called the PMAT. Now, Sajal, you, you follow me on Patreon and you can definitely, if you can't find the node, just let me know. You can just drop me a message and I will try to send you the link. Uh, Ami, Amir Omsen Bayat, I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I'm so sorry for that. It says, he says, it is easy to understand. You can go deeper in deep comp. Look at that. He's making a joke. This is great. We have listeners with material. <laughs> listeners with material that's always great so julian goes asks is there a scale adjustment or something like that to match distance if you are comp a live shot where you know the distance in meters or feet no unfortunately there's no meters or feet inside of nuke it's all values so you can just think about it and it's just you can either choose to be feet or you can choose to be meters but you just have numerical values on the three-dimensional uh, space of Nuke. So I tend to think of the numbers as meters, and then as long as everything is measured by that range, it matches. So because it's a numerical value, you can use it as meters. That's what I do as well. Uh, Stefan Ryan asks, can you bring VDB files and add volumetric cloud smokes to create additional atmospheric effects? Uh, you actually can't do that in Nuke, but you could use that in a plugin for Nuke. It's a plugin called Eddy. And it has the ability for you to read VDB files. I have never used it though, and it's very expensive as well. The plugin itself is almost expensive, more expensive than Nuke itself. So Damien Torn asks, would you use Deep Color Corrector node and the range control to create atmospheric distance fog? Uh, I guess I could. I could use that to create not atmospherics, but actually to grade the 3D in a fog atmos, uh, a fog-like color corrector. For sure, that would be possible. I definitely have used it for that. Cool. So Julian is saying thank you so much for the clear and deep explanation of deep composting. Oh, Julian, look at that. Thank you for the deep and clear explanation of deep. Julian also has some material. I love when uh, our, my viewers have some material and they make some jokes. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So uh, Root uh, says thank you so much. The session was very informative. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, jo John Castillo says, thank you so much for the demo. Really appreciate your streams and everything you do for the people trying to learn and improve composting. Oh, thank you so much, John. Really means a lot for you to say that. Thank you so much, John. Um, maybe, you know, 
uh, thank you so much for that. And maybe, you know, you can tell your friends about my streams and tell your friends about my videos. And then they can also join the fun as well. Uh, this is a, a strange question. So Nickel asks, what headphones are you using? So I'm going to just take them out. So the headphones are the, I can't pronounce this thing. So it's called uh, Bayer, Bayer Dynamic and it's the DT. I hope you can see it. I don't know if you can see it. I don't think you can see it. Uh, no, it's basically uh, the Bayer Dynamic. It's called DT770 Pro. Um, those are the headphones I use. They're really good, uh, really high quality. So Manish uh, Sunar asks, uh, have you done deep rendering using Redshift? I have, yes, it's very nice. Uh, this is the last project I did, which I can't show yet, was using that. Uh, so Olaf is asking, Hugo, will you visit Warsaw? Oh, I, hello, hello, Olaf, Olaf, I know you, Olaf. Thank you so much for being here. I haven't talked to you in a long time, Olaf. So Olaf is asking, will you visit Warsaw this summer and have a good beer? Uh, I think so. I usually go every year to, to uh, Warsaw. I hope I go this year again. So I definitely think I will. I most likely will. <laughs> Paulo Ricardo Ramos asks, how many captured photos did you need to create one character for the rat? So we basically put the rat on a uh, rotation. Uh, like, you know, these, these um, uh, wheels that you can present objects or you can do, um, you can just rotate. So we just put it on the top and I think we took like maybe 10 to 15 photos uh, all around the rats so that, so that we can get photogrammetry. It worked really well. So João Bayon, which is one of my students from, Patre from uh, Kickstarter, thank you so much for being here, João, um, asks, how, ti how time did it take to do that work? How much people work with you? So this project, the Vermintide project, was done with four people. We basically had... Uh, three, uh, three composters, no, five people, three composters, one CG artist, and one matte painter. That was it. So it was only five people, and it took us three months to do that project from the day we shot until we delivered. So it was a three months delivery. We had 10 shots, and we had three minutes long cinematic. Um, okay, so, um, that's a really broad question. So I have a question from Anop. What are you, or your tips for upcoming compositors. <laughs> I don't know, man. Just uh, learn your photography, learn composition, read Steve Wright's book. So if you can, sorry, I'm attached to this thing. You should always buy this book. Where's the book? Uh, here we go. This is the book you want to buy. Um, this is the book. This book is called Digital Compositing for Film in Video from Steve Wright. Steve Wright is a legend. He's one of the best compositors in the world. And you should read this book. This book is really going to help you. So that's my first tip. There's many other tips, but I'll have to limit my tips for now. Uh, let's see here. I need to kind of like go through this thing. So Olaf is saying great presentation. Thank you so much, Olaf. Uh, a lot of people are here thanking for the presentation. I thank you for being here. Um, Barak asks, is it for Arnold only? No, it's for Arnold, Redshift. There's a bunch of renders. Mantra can do it as well. Uh, Paulo Ricardo Ramos asks, just to confirm the 3D rat characters are created using Nuke. Yes. So basically, I did photogrammetry on them, not inside of Nuke. I used the photogrammetry application to do the photogrammetry. And then I moved the geometry and the texture into Nuke. Um, so let's see here. Bodis is asking, does it take longer to render deep from Houdini? Yes, it does. So deep information is longer to render. It's heavier to render. It's slower to comp. <laughs> Everything is worse but you get so much more out of it. So that's the thing. Most visual effects companies use Deep. So if you look at ILM, DNEG, FrameStore, everyone uses Deep as well. Um, let's see here. So uh, Ahmet Barak asks, can Deep needs to be 32-bit float? Yes, it does, unfortunately. Uh, I'm just going to jump a few questions. Sorry, you guys, we need to kind of wrap up. So I'm just going to like jump a few. Barak is asking, what are utility passes? So utility passes are what we call the ZD focus node, like the Z depth, the normals pass, the position pass, the object ID pass, every pass that is not part of the beauty, every pass that is not part of the image that you're rendering, which is a, a support pass, like the depth pass or the normals pass, would be called an utility pass. And so you want to make sure you render your utility passes in 30 bit float and then render your beauty passes, which are the normal renders, into 16. And so, Bayat asks, do effects artists need new compositing? 
Uh, yes, they do. Like, this is an advice for every 3D artist in this uh, chat. Uh, if you are a 3D artist, you should know Nuke. Um, the more we go, the more it gets merged. Like these days, uh, Nuke and 3D is merging more and more. So if you're a 3D artist, you really need to know Nuke because it will help you so much to pre-comp everything you have, you know? Um, let's see here, other questions. So I have Robin Schre Schneider here asking, uh, Hi Hugo, did you use Redshift in Houdini renders for your Vermintide project? Did you use another render? So for this project, we used uh, Mantra for this render, okay? Uh, Philip is asking, uh, are there still benefits using Z-depth position normals compared to deep? Well, there are advantages. If you have a fast turnaround project, if you have a commercials, for example, project, imagine if you only have a one week to do things, you might just want to do deep uh, Z-depth and position in normals than deep. Because deep a, a lot, like takes longer to render, it's heavier to comp, it's going to introduce a lot of problems in your pipeline. You have to have a good pipeline, so... You have to be careful with... Uh, you need to choose the best tools, you know? Um, so Manish is thanking me for the workshop. Thank you so much for that as well. I have Antonio saying thank you. Obrigado. Obrigado, Antonio, as well. Uh, David saying thank you. Thank you so much for you, David, as well. Um, let's see. Anne Cott asks, Hi, Hugo. Is it viable to have a deep image as a background instead of rendering the whole sequence? For a moving character with a camera move, for example, just render one deep image of the background. Uh, it doesn't really work that way because then you would have to project that deep image into the background of the 3D system. I don't think you can get away with that. You probably have to do the whole thing. Unless you're talking about a static camera. If there is no stat, if there's a static camera, if the camera is not moving, then you can use a still, of course. Uh, Jonathan says, thank you so much for the hardware. One more thing. What hardware do you care when most on getting a new computer? Is it RAM or GPU? So for me personally, it's RAM. The reason I use RAM more than GPU is because I'm a 2D artist, right? So a 2D artist, when using Nuke, After Effects, Photoshop, Final Cut, Premiere, all those kind of DaVinci, you want RAM. You need a lot of RAM. And that's why I have 128 gigs of RAM on my machines, which is the maximum you can have. And I can't wait to have 1.5 terabytes of RAM on the new Mac Pro. <laughs> can't wait to do that. Um, let's see here. Um, Nikhil is asking, any plans to go to India? I have been in India already. I've been in Mumbai for, for a week and I presented in Mumbai for several companies, but I would love to return. I would love to return. Yes. So maybe we can talk about that separately, but I would do love, I would love to come back. I had a wonderful time in India. It was a beautiful place and, and I really would like to come back. And um, so, uh, Robin uh, is asking, what did you use the photogrammetry version of the tower for, for exactly? So the photogrammetry of the tower was used for the explosion because we needed the tower intact to actually explode the tower in the explosion. And also the photogrammetry of the tower was necessary for me to actually block the explosion. So we had limits of where the explosion should hit. So that's what we used it for. And um, Olaf is asking, I wonder you use an SSD to SSDs, RAID 0 or NVM2 disks for good cache. I currently use a RAID system um, using, I have like a main RAID system, which is a, a 32 terabytes with normal hard drives. And they're all RAIDed. It's a nine hard drive RAID. So it runs at about 700 megs per sec. And then I have a separate four blade uh, M2 uh, blades. So it's basically a box that has four blades of M2s. And that's the cache that I use for Nuke. So I get about 3000 megs a sec on that caching. Um, so Andre asks more important books. <laughs> okay, so here's another book. This book is also very important. The visual effects, the visual effects handbook. Um, and this is uh, procedures for visual effects. You should definitely check this book out. It's really important. Um, other books here. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 sorry. I'll finish off. There's a lot more books. I have a lot of books here. Another book I should really recommend from Ron Brinkman. Ron Brinkman has this book called The Art and Science of Digital Composting. So he knows a lot about composting. So I would say that these three books, this book, The Visual Effects Society, uh, damn, these, these are really heavy. <laughs> and Steve Wright's books. Look at that. I can now do some push-ups. Uh, so heavy, this thing. <laughs> damn. <laughs> it even makes a noise when it goes out. Um, so Diogo is saying, do you use SSD RAIDs? No, I already answered that. I use uh, M2 RAIDs. Um, Paulo Ricardo says, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Barak says AOVs. Yes, that's what I call utility passes and AOVs. Uh, Marco 
uh, Alan Carr asks, what is the criteria for using deep compositing rather than 2D comp only with Z in production pipeline? The criteria is this, Marco. If you have a lot of compositing to do with a lot of elements, like if you have a lot of particles, a lot of smoke, a lot of fire, and especially a lot of atmospherics, you really want to use deep. You don't want to even care about anything else because using a lot of particles and fire and smoke and atmospherics without deep is really painful, okay? And also, if you have a very large scene, it's very important to use deep. For example, if you look at all the films, you know, latest Avengers, if you look at Star Wars, if you look at all the uh, Game of Thrones uh, episodes, they all use deep because of this, okay? So, João says, thank you so much for the webinar. See you tomorrow on Twitch. Yes, you will see me tomorrow on Twitch. Diogo says, thank you so much. Um, so, Dan asks, thank you so much. Uh, Dan says, thank you so much. Thank you so much for you as well. Barak says, thank you so much. Um, okay, I think that's... Um, okay, so, one la I have one last question here. Casper asks, what would you say the difference between Ron Brickman's book and Steve Wright's book? So... Um, I think here's my, my point of view on this. So Ron Brickman's book, which is really heavy. Ron Brickman's book is a much more general book about 2D and composting, right? It's like a generalist book. It's almost like a more suited for beginners. It's, it's gives you an idea of all things 2D. Steve Wright's book is much more technical, much more in depth. So it's like a second stage. You should probably start with Ron's book and then move to Steve Wright's book. And then also check Steve Wright's tutorials and Steve Wright's videos as well. He's really good. Um, what's the, so Barak asks, what's the brand, the boxes that holds the four blades? Oh man, I can't remember that. <laughs> I really don't remember that. Maybe Barak, maybe reach out on Twitch because I can't leave my off, my seat now. The blade is on the back there. I can't really go there now and check. So maybe reach out on Twitter or in Twitch or reach out on Facebook and I can maybe answer you that. Um, and I think I'm gonna, um, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Jo Jonathan is just saying, make a video about your favorite books. Jonathan, I have that plan, but I'm so busy. <laughs> I'm always busy with work, so it's difficult. Um, I'm gonna wrap up this with one final question from Diogo Gardens. So Diogo Gardens says, there is another comp working with deep like fusion and flame. That is true. You can also do deep composting with flame and you can do deep, sorry, you can do deep composting with fusion. I'm not completely sure you can do it in flame. Probably you can. I'm sure you can. I'm, I'm quite sure that flame supports deep. I'm not completely certain, but I'm sure it does. But I know fusion does. So I'm going to wrap up for that for now because I don't want the, you know, thank you folks to be here forever. <laughs> Thank you so much for all these questions. I can't believe we had a hundred, more than a hundred questions. We also had hundreds of people here today and we ran for almost an hour, an hour and a half. So I would like you all to, you know, follow me on all those platforms that I told you. Just keep an eye. If you have any more questions, just jump into Twitch, jump into to Twitter or, or Twitch or, or sorry, or Facebook and ask me again. I would love to see you on my course. So if you want to join my Kickstarter course, please do. Um, and also, of course, please join me thanking everyone on BenQ for making this uh, webinar possible. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be with all of you. And I guess I'll see you on the next time. So thank you so much. And I'll see you later. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. And I'll see you on the next video. Okay? Goodbye. Goodbye.